Now, disruption. Usually when I, uh, I hear the word disruption, it makes me a little uncomfortable. I think it's intended to make people uncomfortable. Sure. Right? So what I'm hoping is that by the end of this next 20 or 30 minutes, that you can help all of us get a little bit more comfortable with the notion of disruption. Um, so, so Standard Chartered has SC Ventures. Um, I, I was looking at the website, I came across um, the mission statement, which I found um, interesting, and, and, and I'll just read it. Being a force for good by fulfilling society's expectation of banking and finance. So my first reaction to that is, I'm not uncomfortable with that. That makes me feel good. Sounds pretty good now. It sounds pretty good. So, so, so why don't you maybe tell me, from your perspective, um, what SC Ventures is, is meant to do, what uh, Standard Chartered is hoping to do through this, and how should the rest of us think about this? Sure, sure. Um, and hi, everyone. Thanks for, for, for having me. The, 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 um, the, the first point I'll make is, uh, is uh, there's a whole range of things that ought to make us a little uncomfortable about banking, financial services, the way the world is, and, uh, and how well matched or we are as, as an industry or, or, or relevant. Um, it's, it's not easy. The one thing that should make us a little more comfortable about it is specifically disruption. So I, I like to think of disruption as an element of redemption and an element of remediation to the fact that a whole bunch of other things make us uncomfortable. Um, the, 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 the statement you just read is, is, is really one that came up when, when I was a banker. And, um, and, uh, and uh, we, were, we were as a group reflecting on what we were doing as a bank or importantly also not doing. Um, and, um, and, uh, and what clients were asking us to do, you know, bank me here in this particular way, uh, go and cover this supply chain of mine, go and um, help with growth, with financial inclusion, with you know, a number of different things, you know, a number of other themes have come up since then. But, but the point being that the, 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 the emerging conviction was that banks weren't exactly fulfilling society's expectations of them. You know, beginning with clients and, and, and broader societies at large. And, um, and, uh, and banks historically have been audacious, pioneering. That's how I think of banking. But, you know, fair enough to say, you know, back of the, of the financial crisis and a bunch of other events, we've become also very risk averse, very internally focused, very process oriented, and, uh, and, um, and perhaps lost the plot here and there. So, so, so the, the, the conviction was let's go and reconcile banking and society. Let's, uh, let's ensure that we serve clients the way they want, need to be served. And, uh, and what does that imply exactly? Going a little bit, which is, you know, in, in, in transaction banking at Standard Charter, we had a number of initiatives. We, we you know, banking the ecosystem is one of them. Um, uh, if, you, if you remember, we talked about it on one of these panels. And, sure. uh, and banking the ecosystem kind of worked, but it didn't really scale. Yeah. I mean, it didn't scale for a variety of reasons, right? So it's, in, it's not that the bank didn't want to do it. It's not the so-called corporate antibodies. That's, that's, that's a bit of a myth. People, generally speaking, want you to be successful. But it failed to scale because of the setup of the bank. And, uh, and so, so we came to the conclusion that we had to, to think of, um, of, of, of business model in, in, in a bit of a different way. That yeah. the, 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 the bank wasn't necessarily set up to operate in a way that it was going to take to do things differently. And so hence the conviction to work inside the bank in the same time as we're working outside the bank and right. experiments with other business models, other ways of doing things, and which yeah. is how SC Ventures was, you know, came about. So yeah. Second yeah. part of your question. And, and so in four years, yeah. um, you've, you've got more than 30 ventures, you've got more than 20 portfolio companies, you've got more than 2,500 fintechs in your, in your community. Yep. Um, tell us about some of your favorites. Tell us some things that we'd love to hear about. It's, it's, it's a little like asking me which one of my children I, I prefer. <laughs> so it, 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 doesn't, um, it, you know, it doesn't really work. Um, but uh, but uh, the, an important point is, uh, is in the mindset of experimenting and, um, and moving fast and, uh, and uh, scaling the things that we want to scale once we think we're onto something, we actually killed a lot of children. 
Mm. Right? So, so, so for a start, you know, the ones that are here on the website are the ones that somehow survived. Yeah. And, and, and the survive in the sense of you know, us forcing them to have, uh, to prove themselves, to have commercial, established commercial validation over time, financial validation. Yeah. As opposed to us thinking it's a great strategic idea. So ultimately, the market decides, not not me, you know, certainly not me, and, uh, or or a bunch of people in a in a strategic department. And so 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 the 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 children that we have on that website are the ones that are doing well. And and oftentimes they're not exactly the ones we created. They've pivoted many times, as we use in the jargon, but uh, but they're uh, you know they're, they're the ones. Um, favor, I, I really don't don't. don't wouldn't like to, to think of it as favorites, but, but, but I would say that the six themes that we have on the websites are, are, all, are all relevant in my mind. It's, it's about, Sorry, there's a bit of an Okay, is it better? All right. Should we start again? No. <laughs> <laughs> so so of, of, of the six themes um, that, we, that, that we have, so digital banking lifestyle, online economy and payments, SMEs, world trade, supply chains, digital assets, etc. Um, the, 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 there isn't a favorite theme for a very simple reason, which is they all intersect and connect. It's, it's one and the same thing which goes back to rewiring the DNA in banking, it goes back to reconciling banking with what clients expect from it. And, uh, and so in that sense, they're, 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 they're all relevant. Yeah. Um, all these ventures, and in, indeed technology partners we work with, in which we may or may not invest, form part of little ecosystems, meaning they all have to make sense in their own right, but they're also mutually reinforcing. Meaning, as they plug into each other, it's more powerful. And, and building that ecosystem, so take the example of world trade supply chains, which is dear to our hearts. Um, the, you know, there's Solve, there's Olia, there's Task Connect, there's our investment and partnership with Link Logis. You know, all these bits and pieces are part of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And as, as a whole, they serve a bigger societal purpose and a very important theme for us. So, a couple of things specifically, we're here at GTR that I'm sure many of you have had conversations about is SME financing or around supply chain. So tell us the story perhaps about some of the, the ventures and, and problems that you all have solved uh, through some of the ventures that you built there. So, so, so the, the, the story that jumps to mind when you ask this question is, is really Part of the genesis of SE Ventures. So I refer to banking the ecosystem. Banking the ecosystem originated for those who remember, you know, with uh, you know within the within, within Center Chartered or or, or nearby. Um, clients were asking us to not only bank them, anybody can do this, but can you bank my suppliers and the suppliers of my suppliers and my distributors all the way to the mom and pop shops? You know, I know them, they're good, they're my ecosystem. Sometimes they say they're my family, um, but they may or may not have a financial statement they may or may not have a bank account sometimes you know can you help yeah. and um and so 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 we set out to 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 demonstrate that with the use of data that we had we could really monitor the risk and over time underwrite the risk just as effectively as 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 we could in a in a conventional sense and uh and and this worked so it, 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 it worked this way um except the bank is not set up to do it this way. The bank has a corporate and institutional bank banking the big guys. It has a typically an SME bank, commercial bank, or however we call it, which banks the middle guys. And then there's a retail bank, which is uh, which is uh, which is set up differently. These these departments sometimes have different technologies. They have different systems. They're set up differently. They certainly don't talk to each other. Yeah. And so so the setup of the bank doesn't really lend itself to do it this way. And what we wanted to do is really integrate, you know, data, so physical flows and informational flows and financial flows, and and uh, and, and put it all together in the sense in, in the context of these supply chains. So from within the bank, we ended up experimenting with what is now called Solve, which is a venture in in India. Uh, Solve today has uh, two hundred fifty thousand SMEs on the platform, transacting some three hundred million dollars of uh, of transaction value uh, on an annualized basis. Which is small for now. It's 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 you know launched you know I want to say a year and a half ago, and it's scaling very nicely. But it's it's just an example of, of approaching the problem completely differently. So it's e-commerce. It's an open architecture platform. 
yeah. people do commerce with each other on the platform, generating tons of data. And then a number of financial institutions, but also logistics providers, insurance, over time, a number of business services can plug in. And indeed, when we talked to SMEs, they weren't saying, give me more trade finance. Yeah. They were saying, help me grow my business, help me find customers, help me deal with uh, all that administration work that I you know, can't deal with, help me deal with tax, et cetera. And so there was an element of approaching it from the standpoint of what they needed, how they wanted to be served, number one. Number two, also, it wasn't about selling a product from the bank. Right. It was about plugging the bank as in where appropriate. Yeah. And that became a venture. Yeah. To yeah. be continued, obviously, to be continued. Yeah. yeah. So, so now I know that you've got um, sort of infrastructure in here in Asia. You've got um, a team in, in the U.S., in Europe, and even in, in Kenya. Uh, um, and it, just in my experience, certainly in dealing with not just banks, but with governments, which have a role to play in disruption and innovation, they approach it very differently. What have been your observations about disrupting in different geographies, and what lessons have you learned about how to, uh, how to go about this successfully, depending on where you're trying to do it? So, so the number of, of tough lessons, but let me start with a positive, which is, which is generally speaking, policymakers, and that includes regulators, are our friends. They think of disruption a little like I described before as redemption in some ways. They want people to do better. They have policy agendas, and to the extent that we set out to serve these policy agendas, be it growth enablement, be it financial inclusion, be it SMEs, um, they'll try and be supportive, right? So this is the first, uh, you know, it's a little generic, but they'll try and be so supportive. Um, the flip side of this is whenever you're asking somebody for a license, if you think it's going to take X time, multiply that X by two or three because it will take a lot longer than you think, and it will be harder, and it will be harder for simple reasons. It's, it's already, you know, people are busy, understaffed, you know, as, as, as they are, but now we're bringing additional things like digital assets, like cloud, like edge computing, like, you know, num num number of, you know, uh, num number of new, new elements. And um, we, financial institutions, are understaffed for this, right? We're building skills. We're building the bench. Yeah. Well, guess what? So are they. So there's nothing to be defensive about. Of course, of course they're understaffed. Of course they have an educational curve to get to get through, and um, and and so 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 it takes time. It takes time. Yeah. Um, the the an element of shared purpose, but an element of patience, resilience, and and doing this. And this is pretty consistent from from yeah. the West to Asia with Africa somewhere in the middle, which is you know it's it's, it's pretty consistent. Right. So I I just want to make sure all of you heard what I heard, right? That policymakers are our friends. Just remember that, that's the important takeaway. Which I believe, by the way. It's, right? it's, 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 it's important, it's important to take that step back and, and, and realize that there is a shared purpose and that we don't, you know, it's not always a negotiation or even worse, adversarial situation where we, you know, where we, where we talk about regulations and the likes. Um, and this is very much what we started with reconciled banking and societal expectations of it yeah which is you know we're supposed to do a good job and if if, if we you know we're serving a higher purpose as as an industry and whatever we do if we not serving a higher purpose when we do it then maybe it's not worth doing yeah which is which is where the industry has lost the plot a few times in history and where we need to be very focused today. yeah yeah so i i know that many of the the folks here work in in similarly large global uh, uh, active organizations that have many fintech relationships or partnerships. There may be several banks here, even some corporates, who are maybe just starting to go down the path of exploring fintech partnerships and relationships. If, if you were to offer advice to that second set, perhaps, which are, which are still trying to get comfortable with how to do this, and do this well based on your experience. What would you tell them about the approach to their investment strategy, their approach to picking the right partners and, and the governance associated with that? Sure, so f for a start, I don't think anybody in this room working for large financial institution 
has hasn't had exposure to fintechs already. So most most banks, most financial institutions have explored fintechs sometimes for over a decade, uh, and and uh, some of them have invested. Most of them have some form of a lab, um, and and, so, and certainly some innovation effort. So 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 it's a it's a it's a, there's a fair amount of collective knowledge, and so I'll, you know I, I'd like to be careful to not uh, sound like I'm patronizing ever, anyone because we have everything to prove, and we're all learning, and we're all learning from each other. In fact, when we set up SE Ventures, we we try and learn as much as possible from, from what other people had done, including their mistakes, which you know we make plenty. Um, the the but part of the conviction, by the way, was that a lot of these efforts had been disappointing in part. And, and the question was why. So, so the question: Why is a lab inside a large organization ultimately not going to transform that organization? This is really hard to do everything inside. Why do a bunch of little investments not move the needle that much? Right? How do you make them relevant, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, and why do ventures take too long to scale and, and and ultimately can become a distraction unless they're integrated in a in a more thematic and strategic effort? Which is uh, you know so, so there's an element of, of of thinking through these things and 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 what didn't work for for people in the past. Um, in terms of engaging with in, in, with fintechs, you know fintech partnerships, I, I you know I'd say th th there's an element of mindset, there's an element of governance, um, and there's an element of selection, as you said. Uh, easy one for a selection. Too small is too small. Too early stage isn't going to be able to cope with a large organization. If you have, if you don't have enough cash in your bank account to cope with my onboarding process as a large bank, you're really better off if I'm telling you to wait mm. because I'll drain your resources. And somebody at the receiving end is playing optionality, has plenty of times, doesn't see the cash going out, doesn't see. Anything. But in the meantime, you're you're a startup, and if if you're really at too too early a stage, it's it's not going to work. And then things will 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 happen down the line where you'll struggle with scale, you'll struggle with multiple markets, you'll struggle with a number of different things. So there's an element of maturity, which is important. Um, too late is can be a great relationship. We have a fantastic relationship with a lot of tech companies as a as a, as a banking organization. You all do. Um, that's not a fintech partnership, right? That's not a you know, learning from startups. It's a, and importantly, you don't need to own the stock of Microsoft or, or IBM to have a great relationship with them. That's, that's so that's a, that's a there's a spot in the middle yeah. where we learn from each other a lot, yeah. right? Where, where the, 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 the company is mature enough to have their own capabilities, their own views, open our eyes to a certain number of things, be it capabilities, but also mindset, ways of working, etc. We got a lot to learn from them, and they can also learn from us, right? The, it's a little like a, a teenager, right? right? It's, it's it's beyond a toddler, which is a bit of a one-way street when you parent them, and it's before they're an adult, where they yeah. you know we can have a good relationship, but they have their own life, and and, and right. they can take care of themselves. But there's that phase where where dialogue is really important, and you yeah. have to keep that dialogue going no matter what happens. And so, 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 so that, that that is the analogy. I think this is the sweet spot for, in terms of the life cycle of a fintech, where where there's a, it makes sense to partner. And I wish point second point mindset. Um, we're big, we're small, typically not always, but you know, typically meaning meaning thinking thinking a little differently about my fifty five pages agreement. And perhaps they're not equipped to respond to an RFP the way a large tech company is. Perhaps IP is all they have. So if I'm trained to protect my IP at all costs, you know, there's an element of realizing that what they bring to the table on day one is is theirs, and what we build together is ours, etc. So, so some some mindset changes, and then you know, last but not least, an element of empathy, which is. Um, Again, not, empathy is not about being nice. It's about being able to understand the other person's position. Yeah. And so uh, it's not about being a big bang, being nice to a small fintech. It's about understanding what that fintech is, where they're at, and, yeah. and, and yeah. making the right calls accordingly. Right. Right. Interesting. So, so perhaps maybe against your parental instincts of wanting to adopt an infant or a toddler. Sorry for that analogy. I hope that makes sense to at least some <laughs> people. <laughs> um, so same, same theme. If, if, if you were providing advice or counsel that would, you know, help avoid some of the pitfalls that you've seen, what would you advise regarding approach to business models and approach to, to onboarding uh, once you've established these 
partnerships and approach to culture and things like that. I, so, so this is really me speaking now on on on, on business models and uh, and uh, and uh, a lot of it is going to be evolving. But I, let me start with a with, with a bit of a an, an assumption, a working hypothesis, which is uh, which is what we've been witnessing in the last little less than a decade, I think, in uh, in, in 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 business is the emergence of alternative business models to the corporation. We've seen platforms emerge. And increasingly, we're seeing sovereigns, sovereign individuals, and and uh, and and and, uh, and 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 people becoming companies in their own right, um, and, uh, and and so forth. And so, so 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 we're seeing different ways of of operating. If I if I contrast, and that's going to be familiar to most people in this room, if I contrast a platform to a corporation, including a bank, a bank is organized vertically in pipes. I'm manufacturing not widgets but mortgages. I'm selling them to someone else. Um, at you know as much as possible, as high a price as I can for as low a cost as I can. That's how I'm organized and set up. Yeah. And so I have channels. They can be digital. They can be physical. It doesn't matter if they're channels. Platform is horizontal, right? So it's not that I'm doing something to you on a platform. You're doing it to yourself as a community. I'm orchestrating a platform, and then people plug into the platform. Fundamentally different setup, different organization, and different business model. Very different way of monetizing it. We we'll talk about that. It's complicated. Just being a platform doesn't mean you're you're sitting on a gold mine always. Um, but 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 importantly, the, the, the mindset, the organization, all of this is going to be different. In other words, when an established vertical corporation says we're going to be a platform, not going to work. I don't think so. And this is mm. where I'm saying this is me speaking. Right. Th that is the rationale for us thinking. Well, this is what we have to do. Certain things outside the organization. And start again. It's yeah, the tech stack matters, but it's not just about the tech stack. It's not. It's not just about hiring new people. It's not. It's not just about the entrepreneurial mindset. All of these things matter a lot, but the setup, the model, is 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 really what makes it so hard for established corporates to change themselves. By the way, there's a challenge. How many established corporations have genuinely changed themselves in the course of corporate history, and done it successfully and gotten credit in the stock market? And you, if you think long and hard about it, I think you'll struggle with financial institutions, and I think you'll struggle, generally speaking, with, yeah. with, with you know, I can think of a few examples, but they're very few and far between for exactly that reason. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm mindful that our, our clock is running low, but I want to, uh, I can't let you get out of here without giving you a bit of a futuristic, you know, blank sheet of paper question. So the, the last session that we have for our program today is going to focus on the future of money and the future of banking. So you see a lot of innovative startup companies or semi-mature fintech companies. You see different ways of thinking. I'm sure it's allowed you to, to sort of think outside of the box. Help us to look three years, five years, maybe even more if you're comfortable into the future what do you think is the future of banking and the future of money? So that's, that, that is the, the crystal ball question. And, um, but, but fair enough, we need to think about this a lot. I think um, what, what jumps to mind is, um, is you know, I just alluded to it you know, before we talked about platforms, which is you know, the concept of sovereign individuals, people becoming companies, people owning their data, people owning their identity, people migrating seamlessly on and offline in the metaverse, in virtual reality, in physical reality, and doing things. And, uh, and, uh, and this is, this is a, a state of affairs, you know, you can call it the age of information, you can call it, um, you know, the next revolution, as some people do. Um, this is a state of affairs where, where the way we, in, we humans interact with each other could be fundamentally different. We can reflect on the, the day in time where people will spend more money on their avatars than they spend on themselves, mm. which is interesting because then you're going to want insurance for that. You're going to want to protect their identities more so than you protect your own and so forth. This is some crazy thoughts, right? But, but uh, uh, multiple avatars, by the way. Like we have multiple personalities. I'm a banker today. I was an entrepreneur yesterday. And, and so... It, it, that, 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 that applies to the metaverse. So all these concepts raise really fundamental question about, I think, 
identity. Yeah. yeah. The way we transact. Right. Right. I would expect, you know, not to, proverbially, we forgot to put money in the internet when the internet was invented. But I very much doubt that people will forget about money in the context of the next generation of Web3, et cetera. Right. Um, the way I, I would expect transacting payments, et cetera, to be, to be, to be central to the architecture of how we interact together. I wouldn't say who controls identity because it's the wrong word, but whoever masters identity mm. probably masters finance. And, uh, and, and I really think that banks, and with banks here, I mean organizations who are accustomed to operate in a hyper-regulated environment, you know, aware of the fiduciary and other duties that it implies. Banks have a role to play in building the infrastructure for what I've just described. Yeah. So safe, robust, over time compliant, because you have to comply with something first, but you know, safe, robust infrastructure based on trust, where, where we can talk about who controls master's identity, or what, what pipes we'll use in the future, et cetera. So the, the, there is a role for, for the financial institutions of the future in the futuristic world I was describing yeah. to, be, to, to be continued. Right? Okay. So the metaverse, it's a real thing. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for your time. We, uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Tom. It was great to see you again. Good to have a good chat and nice to reconnect with lots of familiar faces I haven't seen for a few years. So thank you for having me here. Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you again. Appreciate that.